Good morning, everybody. Let's worship the Lord.
to you You're where my help comes from Give me wisdom You know just what to do
worshiping not only through song but through giving. If you feel led, we have agape boxes on the back wall. And then also a link will appear on the screen where you can give in the app. One more thing I want to make you aware of in our app, you, I want you to take advantage of is our prayer um, section. We have a group of people that get up really early that want to pray over the needs of this body. So just take advantage of that and send in your um, prayer requ requests that way. There will be kind of an instructional on the screen up here if, you have, um, if you're not familiar with the app. But will you join me in prayer as we go before our King? Lord, would it be true that when we sing your praise will ever be on our lips, Lord? I pray that that would be true, Lord. I pray that that would be it would be honest before you, Lord. We don't always do it right, but thank you for your grace, Lord. Thank you for your mercies that are new each morning, Lord. Thank you for the rain today. And Lord, I want to ask, Lord, that you would be enthroned upon our praises. That whether or not we're feeling it, or feeling good, feeling tired, feeling happy. It doesn't matter whatever we're feeling, Lord, that you would be our king forever, that you would be enthroned upon our hearts, Lord, that we would sing because you're worthy, that we would get excited about you because you're good and what you've done already, and that if you never were to answer another, another one of our prayers ever again, Lord, you would still be enough. What you did on that tree 2,000 years ago would still be enough, Lord. We love you. In your name I pray, amen. You gave your life for mine Nailed to the cross You crucified all my sin and shame it was washed by your mercy you are the treasure i find my reason for living so let my life become an offering to the one who All praise to the one who saved my life All praise to Jesus Christ My King of heaven, my King forever You stormed the gates of my heart between was torn apart now you hold the keys to the grave cause you bring things to life you roll stones away it's all praise to the lord most high all praise to the one who saved my life all praise to jesus christ
All praise to the one who saved my life. All praise his name, Jesus. My King of heaven, my King forever. The Bible teaches that worship at its most basic essence, if it's true worship, involves surrender. When we think of worship as being singing truths, we miss out by thinking, well, I'm worshiping the Lord because I'm acknowledging things that are true about him. But there in the book of Romans, it says that our reasonable service of worship is total consecration. I like to say worship, in essence, is affectionate surrender. The word worship in the Greek language literally is, if we just translated it, is to kiss toward God. To give reverence to a king was to acknowledge him as our sovereign. And so if we're worshiping the Lord, we're doing more than admitting things that are true. We're saying something about ourselves personally and that we want to actually hear from him, obey him. So we're about to receive communion, and I'm looking forward to that. But once again, communion is easily, I don't care what church you're from or part of, can become just ritual, not really an expression of anything that's going to change. And so I, I want to challenge us and encourage us and equip us and prepare us for taking a communion today. You know, Paul the Apostle writes this. He says, I want men everywhere in all the churches to lift up holy hands, to pray lifting up holy hands. And you say, well, okay, I'm supposed to raise my hands. It's not about your hands being lifted. That's fine. But he then describes it this way. Lift up holy hands without wrath or dissension. In other words, the hands that I need to raise to praise God need to be, well, empty. Maybe the empty of the things that I'm focused on, just getting in the way of me really considering him. Sometimes it's empty, just empty of my own plans. I've got my own will of what I'm going to do, and I'm not sure what God wants, but I'm focused on wanting what I want. I hope God bless my will, you know, instead of, Lord, I want to discover and obey your will. But it says without wrath, that's anger or dissension that's arguing, and maybe there's someone you're at odds with. Maybe you're ticked off at your son or your daughter, your wife, your husband, and God's saying, I, I want you to let go of that. If you're going to lift up holy hands, then you've got to let it go. Maybe the lifting up of hands is an expression of surrender. I mean, when I was a cop, I said, stick up your hands. Mano sariba. I speak multiple languages of how to <laughs> do that. Because we all know this, you know, this is like, I'm, I'm surrendered, I'm not going to fight. Maybe, maybe there's something in your life the Lord's saying, hey, lift up holy hands in your heart. Surrender the problems that you're struggling with, that you're mad about, you don't understand. Just, just surrender it to me. It's an act of worship. It may not feel like an act of worship to you. Maybe it's discouraging. I, I got to stop worrying about it. If you're worrying about it, you're not trusting him. So I want to encourage you. Come to the Lord, worship him for what he's done, and express that by by some form of surrender to him this morning. Let's pray. Father, you've got a work that you want to do in us, and it's not just to take a little piece of bread and grape juice and remember something that happened historically. It's beyond that. We know you want us to apply it to ourselves personally, and we do want to worship you. We want to learn to worship you. Lord, we want to worship you in a way that is received by you as true worship. So help us to see what we're holding on to that we need to let go. Help us to love you for what you've done, but also to demonstrate our surrender to you by letting things go. Thank you for the bread. Thank you for the cup. In Jesus' name, amen.
you take your bread in your hand. Jesus said to his disciples, the night they were about to, compl- all of them, blow it. They were all going to sin that very night. Forsaking him, denying him. It didn't change what he thought about them. And it doesn't change what he thinks about you. You don't know your future. He does. He's not dealing with you based on your future failings. And he's certainly not dealing with us based on our past failings. Jesus took the bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body given for you. Whenever you eat it, remember me. Lord, your sacrifice doesn't make our sin okay. Our sin is still why you had to die. Our sin still brings dishonor to our God and brings damage into our life and our relationship with you and others. Your dying on the cross did not make sin okay. But your dying on the cross made our sin forgivable and completely able to be forgotten by a living God who is just and must punish sin, but has now for us. And so we stand in awe as we stand now in the grace of God, ready to receive your mercies that are new this morning, ready to admit we need them, but really not to focus on ourselves at all, but just to focus on you. What a good God you are. What an incredible Savior you are. We are amazed at your grace that we need, that you have available right now right in this moment, this morning. So forgive us, cleanse us, wash us. We receive it, we accept it, we need it. And now, Lord, we want to do what you said to that woman when you said, go and sin no more. Lord, would you not only heal us from what sin has done, what it's ripped us off from, restore to us the years the locusts have eaten, that you might be glorified as a redeemer, but then give us by the power of the Holy Spirit the power to say no, to be set free from the sin to which we've been enslaved. Thank you for the cup, in Jesus' name. After supper, Jesus did bless the cup, and he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Every time you drink it, remember me. Then, Lord, here we are, the bride, looking forward to the day that you said you would give us this cup in heaven that you're going to serve us, Lord, until that day we just want to learn to serve you. But thank you that that day is coming and this cup is a foretaste of drinking it from your hand in heaven. We love you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, all right. Praise the Lord. You guys can have a seat. Good morning, Calvary Chapel. Good to see you guys here in the house of God. Woo, we are here. Rain or shine, Jesus is mine. There, ooh, that's a good vibe. There we go. Uh, today we have our announcements. So would you open up your bulletins? Uh, if you're joining us online, you can access that bulletin on our website, cc ea .org, or really the upgraded way would be to download our Calvary Chapel East Anaheim app. On the app, not only can you find the announcements, you can register for the announcements and find more than just the announcements. You can find recent sermons. You can find Pastor Bob has written some resources about prayer and quiet times. You can submit prayer requests. You can even follow along in this sermon in a few minutes right now with interactive sermon notes. So all I to say, I encourage you to download our Calvary Chapel East Anaheim app on all Google and Apple platforms for free. So please get that if you don't already have that. And here are some announcements I would love to spotlight for you today. Uh, number one, it's really rare that we have this, but we have some spots for our church camp near Yosemite at Sugar Pine. So if you want to go to our family camp, we would ask you to go on the app and reserve your spots today. These spots are very rare to find, so we encourage you, if you want to fellowship with the body of Christ and enjoy God's creation and God's people, just a really unique weekend to get, get away, be a, part, be a part of the family of God with your family. So we'd love for you to be a part of that if you are free. Please sign up for that. Also today at 3 p.m. we have a biblical financial principle class available to you at no cost. And we'd love for you to really just learn more about how to be better stewards with the money God's given you. 
We as Christians are not called to worship money. We're you to, you, called to use money as worship unto the Lord. And therefore, I encourage you guys to come out and hear. Here's the, the focus today. It's explaining different sources of income as well as retirement planning and strategies. So that's right here at 3 p.m. We would love for you to be equipped to grow in God and the knowledge of his word practically in using our finances. Also, we have an anti-trafficking seminar this coming to, this coming Saturday, excuse me, uh, right here at Calvary Chapel East Anaheim. Uh, it's been from 9 a.m. to noon. It's free. And it's about raising awareness to the serious issue of trafficking as well as how we can practically get involved in being God's hands and feet in bringing redemption to the situation. Uh, we also have a special guest, Congresswoman Young Kim, will be here as well. And we'd love for you to be part of that. Details are in your app and your bulletin for that. Also, you might see out in our courtyard, though it's raining, uh, we have a bake sale for Cuba. So we'd love for you to support that mission and go out there and enjoy some sweets to the glory of God. Uh, so go out there and enjoy those things. And also, as you know, we live in a very crazy world, and this is a busy church, and therefore I want to encourage you to sign up for our church text updates. And the number has changed. And therefore, my, my jingle has now RIP, RIP. However, the new number is if you text CCEA to 714-695-9650, you'll get updates about prayer requests, changes to events. It's basically our first way of communicating to you. So if you've already signed up to the number, the 59769 number, you're good to go. But if you have not signed up for church text numbers at all, we'd love for you to sign up so we can send you updates about changes around here and just things that are important for you to know. So please sign up for that. And also, I want to invite you out to our Wednesday evening service. We call it Next Step because we believe it's the next step for you to grow in relationship to the church body here at Calvary Chapel East Anaheim as well as in the Lord. And we have service every week at 7 p.m. Pastor Bob is leading us through the Old Testament currently in Deuteronomy. But even before the service starts, we serve dinner at 5.30. If you sign up for those text alerts, you'll know what the menu is because we keep, it, we keep it fresh every week with a new menu. So that's really great. We'll do fellowship and break bread with fellow believers. We have about 200 people come out and just enjoy one another at that time in our courtyard. And kids under 12 eat for free. We have a bouncer right there for kids as well. We have pizza always on tap just in case people want that. And then we have service at 7. We have children's ministry which is blowing up is amazing. I would love to have your kids be involved in that. We have youth ministry and Spanish ministry as well. So all that to say, we'd love to see you Wednesday evenings. But that is all for my announcements. Back to you, Pastor Bob. Thanks, Josh. Appreciate you. You know, by the way, on that human trafficking seminar, I do want to encourage you to come. It's free, and we are basically trying to help the body of Christ realize that this is an area where there's a great need for ministry in our culture. Um, many of you may have heard of or have seen um, The Sound of Freedom, the movie. And maybe you watch it and at the end you thought, that's horrible what's happening. Well, what can I do about it? Um, we as believers are wanting to explore ways that God can use us as a church to minister to those who are victims of human trafficking here in Orange County. And you might think, are there any? And there are. So if you are interested or if you were touched by that movie or maybe you're saying, I'm open to hearing what the Lord has to say, I challenge you to come Saturday. I think it's going to be well worth your time. A couple of other things we want you to know about. We have been growing in our community groups. Lots of people are taking advantage of the midweek Bible studies in people's homes, so much so that we need more hosts. So if you are... Um, maybe you're attending one. I'm not trying to pull you out of the group that you're in, but if you're not involved in that yet and you're wanting to know more about well, what is that, it's about opening your home once a week for four weeks, uh, actually over a course of eight weeks, so it's every other week really, four times for a uh, Bible study that'll be done by video. You don't have to teach the Bible. We prepare it, we have you present it, and then we even give you the questions to discuss. But it's using your home, your apartment, whatever it is, for the glory of God. And, and it's a kind of a one and done. You're not required to keep doing it. Many of the groups want to continue meeting. We're not requiring that of you. But if you're here and you've been coming to our church for a few months and you feel like I'm definitely a part of it, I just know, don't know how the Lord could use me. Maybe God has already given you the ability to be used this way. We could really use your help. Go to our app and get more information and we'll get back with you to make sure that that's a good fit for you. But we want you to join community groups. But if you're able uh, maybe to consider hosting one. And then we do a newcomer's lunch. Many of you have been to it, but it's really for anybody who's never been. So maybe you've come to our church a long time, never come. You're invited, but we need to know you're coming. It's next Sunday after second service. Immediately after the service, we'll, 
We'll have lunch together. The pastors and wives will be there. And we just want to get to know you. So give us that chance. But we uh, want you to tell us you're coming and how many meals to have ready for you. Because it's going to be a, a free lunch and uh, some time spent just enjoying some company. Hearing more about the church, of course. But also hopefully getting to know you personally on a much better basis. All right. I'd like you to open your Bibles to the book of Revelation. We're still there. We're not done with that book even close. So why don't you open your Bible there. Maybe you're new with us. Welcome. We do go through the New Testament on Sunday mornings, verse by verse. We go through the Old Testament on Wednesday night at seven o'clock. But today in the book of Revelation, we've actually only covered one verse of the whole book. So don't worry, you didn't miss that much of the book. But because it's stopped in the middle of a sentence with a comma, I'm going to go back and read from the beginning. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants, the things which must soon take place. And he sent and he communicated it by his angel to his bondservant John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is he who reads... And blessed are they who hear the words of the prophecy. And blessed are they who heed the things which are written in it. For the time is near. Father, we are coming to listen. We are coming not just to listen, but to live what we learn. So Lord, would you give us the ability to hear from you, not just me, but to hear directly from you from the passage of scripture we're in. I pray you'd open our hearts to understand it, to believe it. And then to know what you want us to do with our behavior because we have come to understand it. So we love you. We give you our study in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. You might know this, but every year there are literally millions of dollars spent by different scientific organizations that are seeking to find out if there is intelligent life outside of the earth. Beyond man. Is there, is there any intelligent uh, life beyond humankind? Now, there are some people who are wondering if there's any. Anyway, but I'm uh, not sure why people like artificial intelligence to begin with. But when it comes to this, there are organizations that have radio telescopes. They've been around for quite a while now, maybe 50 years or so. And they are probing the deepest parts of space trying to listen. They're like listening ears that can go deep into space to, to receive sounds. And of course, they're looking for patterns in the sounds that would give evidence that it's not just you know, random sounds, but some kind of a coded message that might be a message from some, who knows, other kind of life source out there. It's even given rise, this whole question of looking for alien life or intelligent life forces outside the Earth to what has been called the Fermi Paradox. Maybe you've never heard of that, but the Fermi Paradox is actually, uh, it was a guy named Fermi who's, who, who brought it up some years ago, and that deals with the discrepancy between the lack of conclusive evidence of advanced extraterrestrial life and what they consider the apparently high likelihood of its existence. And as a 2015 article put it, this is it. This is the the paradox. If life is so easy to come by, someone from somewhere must have come calling by now. And so there's a big question like, is there any out there? Because at least thus far, we have not found any proof of any intelligent life outside of mankind. Now, I find it interesting that man spends all this money and all this time looking for some voice from outside of ourselves, from some intelligent life force, when the Bible claims to be exactly that. The fact is, the answer, is there intelligent life beyond man? Absolutely. We don't need to look for it in terms of some alien communication. The Bible, in the book of Revelation, tells us that this message came through not an alien, but an angel. There are intelligent life forces. God's told us that. He's created them. And this message is not only through an angel, but it is from God himself. And in the text we're looking at today, we're still at the beginning of the book. Before we get to the content of what's been revealed, we're going to learn today that God has promised a blessing on the person who will receive this revelation. And really, there's a blessing given to the person who will transmit it. A blessing that you and I need to consider as John is mentioned as the one who received and transmitted the message. So put this down. First principle, 
We want to be a faithful witness to Jesus Christ. A faithful witness. Here in our text, in verse 1, we are told that Jesus communicated this to his angel, and then to his bondservant John. Now, if you weren't with us last week, we talked about what a bondservant was. Remember, a bondservant is somebody who has no will of their own, or they've resigned that will for the will of their master. And John is called, as we should be, because it says this is written to bondservants. We talked about that last week. But then it describes John this way. He testified, past tense, to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. So the revelation was a vision. He saw it. It doesn't say he heard it. It doesn't say he read it. He saw it. And it's important for us to understand. By the way, this book is not the book of revelations. It's the book of revelation, singular. Usually know somebody who hasn't really read it when they call it revelations. Yes, there are many things that are seen, but it is one singular revelation. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ and his purpose and plans for the church and for the future. But it is singular, the revelation, according to the scripture. Now, put this down. God's servant, we see from the text, receives God's revelation. We want to realize this. Yet, yet this message came to John, but he is described in the text as one who has already testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, what is that talking about? Well, let's remember John. He is the apostle John, one of Jesus' disciples. He wrote this approximately around 95 AD. Most of the other apostles have long since gone to heaven. He's the only last remaining alive apostle. By the way, they were all martyred. He survives and dies a natural death. But here, what's interesting to me is that we look at the life of John and the ministry of John in the Bible. John, as you know, wrote three types of literature that are included in the inspired text. There is the Gospel of John, then there are the three epistles of John, and then, of course, this prophecy, this word of prophecy written at the end of the Bible. It's interesting to think about those three types of literature that John gave us, because they're all a little bit different. John wrote the Gospel of John to present Jesus as the Savior, by the way, not just the Messiah of the Jews, but the Savior of the world. He says so in the end of the book. Many more signs did Jesus do, but these things have been recorded that you might believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and in him have eternal life. So John tells us he's written the gospel that he might present Jesus as Savior. And what are we to do with it? We're to believe. Then in the epistles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, which we have studied together a few months ago, we realize that Jesus isn't just the Savior, but he's also the sanctifier of those who are saved. And there, the point isn't written to get somebody to believe in Jesus for salvation. It's written to people who already have. So not that they would believe initially, but so that they would, listen to me, be sure of their salvation. Remember, he says so right there at the end of the book. He, you know, these things have been written that you may know you have eternal life. It's written to believers. So you can say, am I a true believer? So the gospel, so that we would believe. The epistles, so that we would be sure of our salvation. And now the book of Revelation, John is going to present Jesus Christ as the sovereign king. The king of kings and the Lord of lords. And the message is, be ready. Be ready, for he is coming back. Now it's interesting, each of the seven letters to the seven churches that we're going to study in the near future in the book... At the end of each particular message to each church, to Ephesus, Myrna, Sardis, etc., each message is given to a particular church. They're slightly different from each other. It's a very unique message to each church. But at the end of each one, we have the same words that Jesus speaks. Let him who has ears to hear, hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. In other words, while it's a message given to an individual church, Jesus says, actually, I want everybody to listen to each of those messages because I have something to say to you from every single one of them. And so the Lord is giving revelation beyond just those particular churches that receive them at that time. But God's servant is described as one who receives God's revelation. You know, one of my classes I had to take in college was speech. I almost dropped out of college because of that. I was terrified that I didn't want to get up ever in front of anybody. God's kind of changed my life, huh? But at that time, I was terrified of it. And uh, so I dropped the class the first semester. 
Next time I went to the counselor and said, what can I do other than speech? They said, you need to take speech. I go, oh, great. So I took it again. One of the, one of the speeches we had to do was an inf informational speech, which has got to be the most boring speech in the world. You know, It's like you get up and you talk about something that people already know about and you explain it. And so I decided to do mine on the CB radio. I was into CB radios when I was in college. And I had this handheld big walkie-talkie. It was a CB radio and you know, big antenna. And I made a big chart, that, uh, a, a big picture of it. And I had little arrows going, you know, this is the volume. <laughs> this is the squelch. This is the transmitter. This is the antenna. These are the channels. I mean, just like, yeah. Well. So I was supposed to give this information. And I thought, that is just a boring speech. I don't know why anybody would have to do these. So. Um, I, I, at one point during my speech, I, I explained, you turn it on right here, it's the on-off switch, and I turned it on, and I said, that's static that you're hearing. And, uh, and so then I explained to him, now this transmitter button is what you gotta push if you wanna communicate, or try to communicate. And I said, you know, you might say something like, breaker, breaker, is there anyone out there? And uh, that's kind of CB language, you know? And, uh, and as I demonstrated that, somebody else came back talking to me during my speech. <laughs> Go ahead, breaker. <laughs> they said, what's your 1020? Which I happen to know means what's your location? I go, uh, I, I said, they're asking me my location. I said, uh, I'm, I'm in Fullerton right now at Fullerton College in a speech class. And the person there said, who's your professor? I said, I said, his name is Noel Gilbert. He goes, oh, that's a terrible professor. He's awful. I turned it off really quick. And... Well, that was my friend down the hall that was set up for that moment. Well, I got an A on the speech, but <laughs> students loved it. Anyway, my point of sharing that silly story is this. You can study a radio. You can take it apart. But if you never turn it on and you never tune it in, you're not going to receive nothing. Too often the Bible and too often prophecies are things people study to understand them, but they're not receiving anything. Why? The message is given to those who won't just receive it, but actually are willing to do something with it. Put this down. To bear witness, you must become one. It says that John bore witness as he testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ. You're not a witness of what you've learned. You're not a witness because of what you know intellectually, biblically. You're not a witness even because of what you believe theologically. You're only a witness because of what you've experienced personally. You can't get up in a court and talk about the things you know. I mean, yes, they have expert witnesses who do that. But you can't bear witness to whether something happened or not. You actually have to have a personal experience. You know, when I was a police officer, I'd be dispatched to accident calls all the time. And I would go there. There'd be a couple cars usually, and hopefully nobody's injured. But I gotta, my job is to make sure people are safe that are driving and that they're safe. And I'm going to take a police report and try to figure out what happened. Whose fault was it? It was always interesting to talk to the two drivers. They usually had a very different opinion about that. And so did the people in their car who usually voted for the driver. But anyway, that was my job to try to decipher based on the evidence what happened. But I would always look for witnesses. Now, quite often there were plenty of people that saw it, but they were like already gone by the time we got there. They'd see us coming, go, ah, I'm out of here. I don't have time to mess with that. But there were always a few people that were, hey, hi, officer. And I would say, did you see the accident? Oh, yeah, I you were a witness? Yeah. Uh, well, tell me what happened. Well, I was in my house and I heard the screeching of tires and the horn and the crash. So I came running out. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. You didn't see the accident. Well, I did. I, right after that, I came right out. No, you're not a witness to the accident. You may have been a witness to something right after the accident, but you can't, I don't need you to understand what I need to know. Don't, I don't want to give, don't tell me what you think happened with the light and anything else. You see, the question really is this. Are you a witness of Jesus Christ? Remember what he said to his disciples, by the way, who were very interested in end times things. This is in the book of Acts. After Jesus rose from the dead, they realized he was the Messiah. And in their minds, the Bible says, well, Messiah is going to establish his kingdom on the earth. 
a forever kingdom. Son of David, he's come back to rule. So I, we didn't get the cross thing, but now we get it. Okay, let's go. And they said this, is it at this time that you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Remember, Israel had been a kingdom, one nation. Then it got separated into two kingdoms. Remember that? After Solomon's son. And then, of course, there were no kingdoms. As the Assyrians came in and wiped out the northern kingdom of Israel, the Babylonians came in and wiped out the southern kingdom. And even though they came back, they were always under some other power. And by this time, now they're slaves to Rome. They don't really have their own kingdom. They have a puppet king named Herod who just does the bidding of Rome. So they said, is it at this time you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus said, it's not for you to know times or epochs, seasons, which the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses. Jerusalem, right where you are. Judea, Samaria, the remotest parts of the earth. You are to be my witnesses. He didn't say, you're to go witnessing. No, no, you are my, you know some things. You've experienced things. You've seen me, you see. And this is what is being said of John when it says he testified to the word of God. You say, what's that talking about? Well, remember how he begins his gospel? In the beginning was halagos, the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. Verse 14 of that same chapter, and the word, Halagos, became flesh, and he tabernacled or dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father. In other words, we saw him ourselves. This is exactly what Peter says. You can jot it down, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 16, with regard to his ministry of the gospel. He says, we, talking about the apostles and the followers of Jesus, we did not follow cleverly devised Tales when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were, what is it? Say it out loud. Eyewitnesses. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He goes on to say, We were on the mountain. <laughs> Peter, James, and John, we, we heard the voice of God. This is my son. Listen to him. We saw him transform. We saw Moses. Alive. We had a personal experience. And so it's important to say, Lord, I do want to be a faithful witness. But then the question becomes, are you? Have you become a witness? You say, well, what do you mean? Remember in Romans 8, it says this. When you become a Christian, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside you. And the Bible says his spirit, listen to me, bears witness with our spirit that we're children of God. There's an inner reality to the truth that you've learned theologically, an evidence that you've actually met the Lord. And he starts transforming you from within. Put this down, number three. God's servant transmits all they receive. I don't know if you picked that up in verse 2. John has already testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even, you might want to circle it, to all that he saw. Huh. You know, John not only bore witness in the gospel of John to his own experience, but if you read the epistles, he did the same thing. Remember how he begins, 1 John? What was from the beginning... What we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we beheld with our own hands concerning the word of life. And what we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, that you also may have fellowship with us. You need to have the same experience that we have. But he transmitted, he shared it with other people. And I believe if we're to receive revelation from God, this is a principle in the Bible, we need to be willing to share it with other people people. I think of Abraham there in the Old Testament, and God is visiting with Abraham in Genesis 18. If you want to jot it down, there's two verses there, Genesis 18, 17, and Genesis 18, 19. And God says this, this is a fascinating statement of the Lord. The Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Abraham is a believer in God, and God is about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And we know that Lot, one of Abraham's nephews, is living in Sodom and Gomorrah. And God says, shall I hide it from him? And then he says this in Genesis 18 and verse 19. I have chosen him, Abraham, so that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about. Actually, in the King James, God makes it clear, I'm going to share it with him because he will share it with his descendants. I find that fascinating. 
In fact, the reason John is on the island of Patmos, well, he talks about it in verse 9. Let's skip ahead. Verse 9, I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance which are in Jesus, I was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. In other words, I've been faithful to share. That's why I was on the island to begin with. And because I've been faithful to share, now God's going to reveal. This is all through Scripture. When we share what we've been given, God gives us more. Many of you know my story. I won't tell the whole thing this morning, but how my wife and I began our relationship. We went out on a, a date. Uh, we went to breakfast, really, and uh, nothing really seemed to be... We, we had a good time, but it wasn't like we were in love. It was just a, a wonderful friendship kind of thing. But the Lord gave me a, a sense in my sleep that things weren't exactly right with Becky. And so it was really awkward. I didn't know her that well, and I thought it would be strange for me to tell her that God was telling me things about her. So I, I wasn't sure I wanted to do that, but God kept impressing my heart that I should pray for her. So when I finally did get some time with her the next time, I said, you know, I really need to share with you some things that are on my heart that God revealed to me. And uh, it was pretty general. It was that she was far from God, which I had no way of knowing, except the Lord put that on my heart, because certainly she didn't say anything like that. I didn't know that. And that he wanted her back. That was it. Pretty straightforward. So she and I went out to coffee, and she said, well, what was it that God showed you? And I remember thinking, man, God, you better be right. <laughs> it's be really embarrassing if you're wrong. Because I'm looking like a dummy just even saying it, you know. So I stalled until I couldn't stall anymore. She said, well, what was it that God told you about me? I said, all I know is God must love you an awful lot. I said, I'm really a total stranger. You don't know me at all. You have other people in your life. I know your parents are missionaries that love you, and I know you have other Christians in your life. So why he would, now I know why, but I didn't then. Because it didn't look like our relationship was going anywhere in particular, you know. So I shared with her, I said, God ministered to me last night that he loves you, and you're far from him, and he wants you back. And as I said that phrase, literally at that moment, not one second before, I knew more. And so I just kept talking, which you know I have a gift of. <laughs> but it wasn't because of that. But when I said, God loves you, and you're far from him, and he wants you back, I knew more. I said, and I know that last night you went out with a guy, he asked you to marry him, and you said yes. And she, her mouth dropped open, and she started weeping. She said, that's all true, but how did you know it? Being the spiritual giant I am, I said, I have no idea. I, 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 I just found out. It's not going to go myself. I, I know. This sounds strange to you. You don't even believe it happened. I lived it. It happened. Well, now I know God had a plan for her and us to be together, but it started with him wanting to reach into her life and to demonstrate it was God in a way that only God could do. But here's my point. I didn't know it at the time, but by me being faithful at sharing the tiny bit of information I had, that was when God would then give me more. Do you remember when Hannah, who wanted a son, couldn't have one, was blessed actually through the prayers of Eli, who was kind of a backslidden high priest at the time, and God brings her the desire of her heart, and she has a little boy. And she dedicates him to the Lord. His name is Samuel. His name, by the way, means asked of the Lord. It's, his name means prayer request. A prayer answered. And so she makes this commitment to dedicate him to the Lord for his whole life. I mean, we, we do baby dedications here. We do child dedications all the time. Parents that say, I want to raise my kid in the Lord. That's great. But this one, can you imagine if parents, when they dedicated their child to the Lord after a few months, you know, they bring the baby back. Here you go, Pastor. Bye. Well, she brings her son Samuel, and when after he's weaned, maybe at the age of three or four, back to Shiloh, where Eli is, and says, here you go. He's, he's yours for the rest of his life. And Eli accepts this gift, and little Samuel becomes a, a servant to Eli. He's just a little boy, helping whatever a four-year-old could do, you know, learning how to help the, the high priest. And one night, little Samuel is going to bed, and he hears a voice. And the voice is his own name, Samuel, Samuel. He, he thinks it's Eli. So he runs to Eli, he goes, you called me? He goes, I didn't call you, I'm go to bed, you know. And Samuel goes back to bed and he hears the same thing. Eli, Samuel, Samuel. And so he runs back to Eli and says, you, you called me. He said, I, I didn't, but something stirs, I believe, in Eli's memory. Because Eli doesn't hear from the Lord at this time. Sounds like maybe he used to. Because Eli knows what the boy needs to do. And he tells him. 
The next time you hear that voice crying out your name, Samuel, here's what I want you to say. Say these words to that person who's calling you. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And he does. God speaks to this little boy. And what he reveals to him actually has to do with Eli and the sin of Eli, the high priest of Israel, that God is going to judge him and his house because of his disobedience and the way he's not rebuking his sons who are in sin. God tells this little boy. And then the next day, Eli says, so, what did God say to you? And I'm sure Sam was going, I don't really want to share that with you. And Eli senses it and he says, you tell me everything that God spoke. Don't hold back any of it. Or what was being told you will happen to you. He seems to know that God is speaking to him. It's about him and it's not good. But he wants to hear it. He's willing to hear it. And so Sam, this little boy, tells Eli the whole thing. Eli does accept it, even though he's in sin, as a word from God. And the Bible says from that point on in little Samuel's life, he became a prophet of God. And God never let one of his words fall to the ground, never fail. God started revealing a whole lot more to Sam. you got to be faithful with what God gives you You need to be doing more than just studying it for yourself. You need to be sharing it with others. And God says, I'll give you more. But you're going to have to be faithful. John was. God's servant transmits all they receive. Put this down, letter B. Respond to God's invitation of revelation. Put in the word invitation. Look at verse 3 now. Here's the, the, the carrot. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the prophecy, and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. By the way, this is the first of seven Beatitudes uh, in the book of Revelation. Remember, there are eight Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the merciful, etc. Blessings, some translated happy, or probably better, fortunate. Uh, Blessed by God is the idea, is the person who does these three things. Now, we're going to go through them briefly because some of it you're doing right now by showing up at church. But put this down. Expect to be blessed by reading this book, this prophecy. Not just the Bible generally. There are blessings that come to us when we spend time in the Word of God. Read Psalm 1. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, but he meditates in the law of the Lord day and night. He'll be like a tree firmly planted by rivers of water, bringing forth its fruit. And its... There's a blessing in the word of God, make no mistake. But there's a unique extra blessing that's given in this book, that's only given in this book, for those who will read the words of the prophecy. I can literally say, frankly, you can too. You can tell people, hey, come to my church next Sunday. I guarantee you, you'll be blessed. Because we are, not because of the pastor, he might blow it, but God's going to bless you, man. We're going to be reading a promise of God that he says he'll bless you simply by reading this particular part of the Bible. Now, it's an interesting word to read. It's the word anagonosko. I don't expect you to know Greek, but I try to teach a little bit along the way. Ana is a Greek preposition that means again. Gnosko is the word that means to know. The word to read means to know again, to have it be gone over again or to spend time not just reading it once but reading it again and again actually means literally to have it read out loud. If you want this blessing, you are to read it and to read it out loud. And here's why. You see, the early church would have readers because many people couldn't read. So they had to have the word of God read, the cantor, the, even in the synagogues. They did basically the early church what the synagogues would do. They would have a reader. Remember, Jesus went into the synagogue, took the scroll of Isaiah, and he read it out loud. That's what they did. They would read it, especially for those people who, who couldn't read. But there's a blessing for the reader. So I'm getting blessed just getting to read it to you today. And God's saying, I want to bless you just by spending time to read it. But I want you to notice something that a lot of people miss at this point in the text and in this blessing. It says, blessed is he who reads... The words of the prophecy, please notice it. I have mine underlined, you don't have to. But the words of the prophecy. The blessing is not upon those who understand the themes of this book. And it's not a blessing on those who have the correct interpretation of the book. A lot of people 
get divisive about interpretations of prophecy. Well, I think it's this. Well, I think it's that. Well, let's argue that out, you know. By the way, God hates those who sow discord among the brethren. So I try to stay far away from those things that are going to divide us. And it is true. Some people won't say this, but there are so many interpretations of the book of Revelation. You know what? Uh, we are not commanded to interpret the book. I will give interpretations a long way, but that's not my primary goal. In fact, my interest is not primarily in interpreting the book of Revelation to you as much as it is to discover what God has said. It is his words. The blessing is tied to the words. Interpretations can often be very confusing. You hear something, Mary had a little lamb. How did she do that? <laughs> Never seen a girl with a, having a little. And it, what does that exactly mean? You know, people get confused. Somebody says, hello to me. Hey, how you doing? What did you mean by that when you said, hey, how you doing? Is that like you know what's going on in my life or Interpretations, people get confused. I am convinced that God says what he means and means what he says. We simply need to read what he said. The words, the blessing is on the words, not, well, if it agrees with my particular form of eschatology, I'll be blessed. Well, that's not where the blessing is from God. So expect to be blessed just by reading it. And then put this down, discover the blessing of hearing it of hearing it. And this is talking about audibly hearing it. Why is hearing the word of God so important rather than just reading it? Well, among other reasons is what is said in Romans 10, 17. Here's what Paul wrote. Faith comes by hearing. It could have said reading. It doesn't. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ or hearing the word concerning Christ. You know, I remember back when I was at Biola University, a friend of mine, mine, Mike Sturgeon, who memorized a lot of scripture, he had memorized the whole book of Romans verbatim. And so he invited us all, who everybody wanted to, to come in, and he did a, a recitation of the whole book of Romans audibly for us. It was amazing. And it was different. You know, I had studied Romans, I had taken Romans, I had taught Romans, but I had never heard the book of Romans spoken audibly, out loud, all in one sitting. It was a lot, we actually took a break. We took an intermission at Romans 8 because we had to take a little break. But literally, of course, most of us were there with our Bibles, making sure you didn't miss a comma, you know, but <laughs> might as well be a Pharisee. But it, it was uniquely a blessing. And so many Christians have actually never heard the Word of God read out loud. Maybe you have an audible Bible. Maybe you do it on the way to work. Praise God. But this book is saying, hey, you need to hear it. Don't just read it if you want the full blessing. And I think, well, I do. So I find that interesting because if you think about it, you know, there is a difference. Think about it this way. You get a phone call from somebody. Do we still even make those? Anyway, you make a phone call. You get a phone call versus a text message. Oh, I know. Everybody prefers texts. Texts make no commitment to have any awkward further conversation. They don't have to tie up your time. I know why we do it. I just find it interesting that people want less and less real relationship. I shouldn't find that so strange, but that is the nature of people. But when you have a phone call with somebody, there are some clues many times as to what people mean. Just the inflection of their voice, whether they're excited about something. You don't get that usually in a text message. In fact, sometimes it's just kind of, there's some ambiguity. Somebody said to me, you're not, well, I'm not sure exactly. Did they mean to write that? Or is, or did they miss, uh, you know, sometimes my, my text messenger, you know, is d possessed. <laughs> I have sent some horrible text messages. You know, um, I have an email. If I push go, it gives me time to repent, <laughs> to undo. They need to create a text message that does that because there's sometimes I've cussed at people and I thought that was not what I said. Whoever you are, Siri, wash your mouth. You know, I'm literally just like, oh, maybe a mistake. Shouldn't be doing it while I'm riding my motorcycle because the sound of the engine makes it sound like a cuss. I don't know. I did it once. I did it again. I thought, I'll forget this. I'm just cussing somebody out. Um, <laughs> But the fact is, when you hear someone's voice, it can remove that. Somebody texts you, you know, they just send you back an answer to your question uh, about something, and they just type, yup. <laughs> so you go, what uh, is, that, is, that, is that, was that supposed to be yep? Or is that like, you're sick that I'm asking it? Because it sounds like you're having a bad day over there. I don't, or maybe it's just my, I, you don't know. So there's some benefits of hearing it. And by the way, if, if you are interested in doing this, you don't have to download a Bible app because on our church app, I recorded Revelation 1 um, for you to listen to. Yes, it's my voice, so at least you'll know who, you know, I'm reading it. So I get blessed because I'm reading it. The Bible says so. 
And hopefully, you'll get blessed by just listening to it. I've been listening to myself. I'm blessing myself. It's a, the Lord's blessing me through my voice. It's not the voice, though. It's not me. It's actually him. It's his word. It's his promise. So take advantage of that. Then put this down, number three. God's blessing is on those who obey. We think of the book of Revelation primarily as this revelation of what's going to happen in the future, and yet there are many things within this book that God's saying, now will you give heed to it? That's what this word means, by the way. To take heed to the things written is an interesting Greek word. It's the word tereo, which is translated to observe or to guard or to obey. When Jesus said, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to, here it is, observe. It's actually this word to, to obey, to keep. Not just to learn the words, but to do what I'm saying. And the book of Revelation has many commands. There when we study these seven churches, we're going to find that there's many things. Jesus says, now here's what I want you to do. You've left your first love. Here's what I repent. Remember from where you've fallen. Do the deed. There's commands given to us all through this book. You're thirsty, let him come and drink. There's commands. So the Lord's saying, now, if you want the blessing, you want one blessing, read it. Want another blessing, listen to it. You want another blessing, obey it. And of course, we know that that is always a part of why God gives his word. It's been said to hear God's word is privileged, to keep it as a duty. But Jesus said this concerning his teachings. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. See, the problem is we just stop. Many, oh, if I know these, I'm just blessed because I know them. My friends don't know them, so I can kind of show up. You know, no, 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 no. The blessing isn't in knowing it. The blessing is only attached to doing it. Remember, the difference of the wise man and the foolish man wasn't the one who knew the word of God, the one who heard the word of God. They're, they both heard the word of God. One who hears my voice, hears my words, and acts upon them, he'll be like the wise man. The other guy's a, he knows the word. He hears the word. He doesn't do anything with him. That's why James says, don't deceive yourself. By being merely a hearer of the word and not a doer of the word. What's the deception? Well, because I've now heard a sermon. I understand it. I, got blood. I, was, I enjoy it. I can share with my friends. And I know more than they do. And I'm growing in my faith. Well, actually, you're deceiving yourself. If you just keep hearing and hearing and you're not doing anything different, total deception. So blessed is the person who hears and does. Luke 11, verses 27 and 28. Listen to what Jesus said to somebody who was trying to give a compliment to him. It came about while Jesus said these things, one of the women in the crowd raised her voice and said, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. In other words, man, your mom's blessed to have a kid like you. But he said, on the contrary, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. That's the same Greek word. Observe it, do it. The blessing is on the doer. Years ago, I heard a story of a, of a church that was looking for a new pastor, and so they called this guy. They knew he was a great preacher, and they had heard him preach. Somebody had heard him preach, so they had him come, and the whole little town gathered, the Christians that went to that church anyway, all showed up that Sunday, and he preached a great message. It was phenomenal. People were like, wow, that was awesome. And so they went out and told their friends, you got to come. This new guy is excellent. And so a lot of new people came the second week. The only thing was the pastor that had preached the message the last week preached the exact same sermon verbatim. And the new people thought, this guy is great, wow! And they, people go, yeah. Well, third week, the people that came the second week invited some new friends. The people that came the first week didn't, and yet the place was really overflowing, and same exact sermon the third time. Afterwards, the elders and deacons got the new pastor and he goes, hey, hey, it was great, especially the first time. Um, Don't you have any other messages? He goes, oh, I've got a lot more, but you haven't done anything with the first one that I gave you. Now we think, oh, that would be, that's a silly story. But how many of us are just content to just keep studying? We, we're not doing nothing with it. We're just going to keep reading, just keep studying, because it's enjoyable to learn more. Be careful that you don't fall into that trap. And then under letter C, put this down, realize it's high time to become and remain engaged in our text, it says this at the end of verse 3. The blessing is if you read, hear, and heed, for the time is near. What's it talking about? It's time of Christ's return, the time of these coming things coming to pass. The time 
is near. Romans 13, verses 11 and 12, Paul talks about the same thing, about being obedient, love one another. It's our only real commandment there in Romans 13. If you love, you won't have to have a list of do's and don'ts. You'll fulfill the law. And then he says, and this do, knowing the time. It's already the hour for us to awaken from sleep. Wake up. For now, salvation is nearer to us than when we first believed. The night is almost gone. Dawn is breaking. The day is at hand. Let us therefore lay aside the deeds of darkness, put on the armor of light. The Bible goes on to say, and make no provision for the flesh with regard to its lusts. The fact is, the Bible says these things, his coming is near. Now, I know people stumble at this at this point. It's like, well, wait, that was like a long time ago. People say, you know, people have been saying Jesus is coming back for a long time. God's going to judge the world. They've been talking about that for centuries, and here we are. Peter is talking about the last days, and he says, you know what's going to happen in the last days? Mockers will come with their mocking. And you know what they're going to say? Where is the promise of his coming? For all things have remains. So when people say, you guys, you Christians, you've been saying that for years, you say, well, actually, he prophesied that you'd be coming along to say that. That was one of the signs we were in the end, is people like you saying, where is the promise of his coming? We say, well, yeah, but he did promise. and it come, It's been 2,000 years. Do you remember what Moses says? See, in Psalm 90, he only wrote one psalm, but it's a powerful one. And Psalm 90 is about God's eternality and our transitoriness. We don't live, we've not been alive forever. We were conceived and we've lived and then we stop our earthly lives and that's all we've known is a very short, brief, brief period of time. But he says, God, on the other hand, from everlasting to everlasting, you're God. God says in the Old Testament prophets, I dwell in eternity. In other words, I, his perspective on time is very different from ours. And so in that psalm is where Moses says, you know, a thousand years in your sight is like yesterday when it passes. It's just it's a blip, you know, it's a, not really that long of a time. But for us, it's crazy about it. Our, our, it's very relative, our perspective on time. God in the book of Isaiah challenges those people who believed in other gods. Hey, prove that you guys have, have really worshipped other gods, these idols, by letting your idols tell you the future. Go ahead, tell, tell us what's going to happen. Because they can't. He said, I alone am God and I declare the end from the beginning. Because God dwells in eternity, he sees, he knows everything that's going to happen. Now that's very difficult for us to understand because that's not our perspective. Pastor Chuck used to use, I think it's a great illustration. Um, I don't know if you've ever been to the Rose Parade. How many of you have ever been to the Rose Parade, Pastor? Okay, you should go, just so you can be freezing like us and <laughs> pay your dues. Anyway, but um, if you've ever been to the Rose Parade, maybe you had the privilege of, I don't know, Colorado and Lake is a good intersection, because <laughs> it turns right there and you watch the parade. And if you're watching these floats go by, you know, in real time there's one, and there's another one coming, but you've got to wait. Five, ten minutes, and then another one comes and stops, and they do their thing, and oh, man, they were great. And it just that's the way life is, succession of events. That's the way time is experienced by us. But the illustration is this, that God who dwells outside of time is, an, is above that in terms of his perception of all of history and all of future, of all of eternity. He doesn't dwell, he, he doesn't dwell, you know, his name is Yahweh. I don't know if you know this. Do you know what Yahweh is, that name? It means I am, but it doesn't just mean I am. That's part of what it means. It, it comes from the Hebrew being verb hayah, which means to exist. He is, he is, he was, and he is to come all at the same time, which is beyond our capacity. Doesn't make sense to us. But if you were watching the Rose Parade, not at Lake in Colorado, but from the Goodyear blimp. They've been doing it for 60 years, by the way. Uh, here's an image of the Goodyear blimp over that area. Okay. You could see the whole parade at the exact same time. Whereas we're looking at float after float after float. If you were up there, you'd see it all simultaneously. You'd say, oh, there's the, you know, the, the marching band from whatever. Here's the marine band. All at the same time. To you, it's happening at the same time. You could describe it. God is able to declare the things that are yet future as though they're happening right now. It's not a problem for him. Because he's not limited. And so he sees things that are going to happen and he can describe it. He says, that's proof that I'm God, by the way. And then he's revealed it to us so that we might honor him and not be shocked by the things that are going on in our world. 
You know, in the scriptures, we have teachings about the world, about technology, and many about the nation of Israel. And the book of Revelation has a lot to say to us about that. For instance, in the Bible, we are taught from prophecy, the Jews at some point would be scattered throughout the world. They were a nation, but God told them before they even became a nation, if you don't obey me, I'm going to scatter you throughout the world. Well, that all happened. Through the Assyrians and the Babylonians, and then through the Romans, the Jews were scattered literally, physically, all over the world. There are Jewish populations in every continent. Did you know that? There are people that have never been to Israel, but they're Jewish. All kinds of their skins, all kinds of languages, all over the world. God fulfilled this promise. We are told by God that the nation of Israel would be regathered after being scattered for many years. They would be regathered to their homeland. And that they would be reborn again as a nation. By the way, it even says, can a nation be born in a day? That's exactly what happened on May 14th, 1948. As Israel, which had ceased to be a nation for 2,000 years, was born again. Literally, literally, they're not born again spiritually, but they're born again physically. Became a nation. Never happened before in all of human history that a nation that ceased to exist came back to existence, ever. God promised in the book of Zephaniah that the ancient language of Hebrew, which was a dead language for centuries, would actually come back to life. It is. Children over in Israel, they learn Hebrew. They don't learn Hebrew as some secondary language. They learn Hebrew as their primary language. It's been completely brought back. It's an amazing thing. He promised that the barren mountains of Israel would be blessed and bear fruit as they used to, but no longer were for centuries. And now Israel is fulfilling a prophecy in the Old Testament that it would produce fruit for the whole world. If you go to Europe today and you get an orange at a store, you probably are buying an orange that was produced in Israel, a Jaffa orange. You think of Florida oranges, they're, they're Jaffa oranges. Jaffa is right there in Israel. It's an amazing prophecy, all fulfilled, already happened in our day. A lot of people have no idea about these things. And that God would bring his people back from all over the world and primarily from the direct north of where Israel is. Whereas the first exodus was from Egypt, God says so in the Old Testament. Yeah, they came from Egypt, but this time they're going to come from the extreme north. The vast majority of people who have returned to Israel have come from Russia. Did you know that? The former Soviet Union. And from all over the world, God says, I'm going to bring them from all over the world. I'm going to put them back into their own country. And I'm going to bless them. They're going to be populated again as they used to be. We know the population in the ancient world. We know their population now. God has done exactly what he said he would do. I could go on for way too long, but I just want you to know there's lots of prophecies in the Bible regarding the land of Israel. By the way, the city of Jerusalem. God says it, it, there's a prophecy. Jerusalem, Jesus said, would be trodden underfoot by the Gentiles until the fullness of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Jerusalem was still under Jordanian control until 1967. Some of you weren't born yet. Some of you weren't born again yet. But Jesus said this was a prophecy concerning the end times, that Jerusalem would be controlled not by Israel, but by Gentiles. That all changed in the Six-Day War. It's an amazing prophecy that has been fulfilled. I'm thankful that the capital of Israel is now recognized by the United States since Donald Trump moved the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Presidents, both sides, promised to do that for years. Nobody did it. I'm grateful. God said it's, this is going to be. And then there are prophecies in Zechariah and elsewhere about how Israel is going to be a trouble to the rest of the world. In fact, there's prophecies that say the world's going to hate Israel. Did you know that? Isn't it interesting since October 7th how much anti-Semitism was already there? It just needed an excuse to come out. It didn't create it. It just showed it. And the Bible says in the end, all nations, by the way, including this one, because that's part of all, will be against Israel. Now I'm thankful we're not yet. Very grateful. We're an ally of Israel. Glad we're helping them in this current conflict. But sometimes people see what's going on in the world. They get freaked out. Well, what's going on? Is, this, is Jesus coming back today? Well, I don't know when he's coming back because we're not told exactly when he's coming back. He could come back today. But I believe Christians are not to be alarmists. We should be alarm clocks. We should be telling, as Paul said, hey, the night is far gone, the day is at hand. So, jot this down. How do we remain engaged in a way that honors the Lord? First of all, be rejoicing as your wedding day approaches. Be rejoicing. Revelation 19, verses 7 and 8. If you're taking notes, jot down Revelation 19, verse 7. 7 and 8, let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready and it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean for the fine linen is the righteousness 
of the saints. You should be excited about your day and our day is coming. We're not to be filled with some kind of a frightful expectation. We're to be filled with a joyful expectation and anticipation. Then be ready because your king is coming. Be ready for your king is coming. You know, in the Gospel of Luke, when they came out to ask John, who are you? Because John was baptizing more people than anybody and everybody knew he was. They didn't know who he was. So the Jews, a lot of them thought he was the Messiah. Uh, so they sent, the Pharisees sent out some people to ask him some questions. Who are you? What do you say about yourself? What's your position? And they just finally said, are you the Messiah? And he said, no. I'm hoping you were. Hoping you were claiming to be anyway. Are you then the prophet who was to come? A reference to a prediction in Deuteronomy 18. He said, nope. Well, then are you Elijah? Because Malachi says Elijah's coming before the Messiah. No. Nope. Well, then what do you say about yourself? Who actually are you? He said, well, I'll tell you who I am. I am the voice. In the Greek, it's phone, the sound. I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make way. Make straight the ways of the Lord. Let every mountain be brought low. Let every hill, every valley be raised up because the king is coming. I'm here to get you ready for your Messiah. I'm not the Messiah. I'm, I'm not even worthy to untie his sandal, but he's coming and you're not ready. Folks, do you, do you understand that God was using John in an incredible way and he did not want any attention on himself? Remember what he said? He, Jesus, must increase. I must decrease. When a king would come to visit a town or a city, the repairmen would go ahead of the visit of the king and repair the roads. They didn't want the king to be on his way in his chariot and have some tree knocked down. Oh, we should have dealt with that. And that's a little embarrassing for the town. No, no. All this work had to be done to get ready for that king to come. And he said, I'm just the voice of, I don't, you don't even need to know my name, basically. Just, I'm, just a, I'm just a voice. I do believe that it's possible for Christians even to get excited. What does this mean, this attack from Iran? Is that, does that mean Jesus is about to come? I think it's possible that we can see things related to signs and misread the signs. The Bible does predict that Iran, Persia, will be a part of an invasion attempt on Israel that God will defeat in the book of Ezekiel 38 and 39. We know that. They will be an enemy of Israel in the future. They are now. They're attacking Israel. That's unprecedented. But that's not the fulfillment of Ezekiel 38 and 39. You know, um, my wife and I, when we first got married, I was a police officer in the city of Placentia. And um, we had, uh, not long after we got married, she got pregnant. And we, uh, nine months later, had a son, Jesse, a little baby in our two-bedroom apartment. And I remember one night, she woke me up out of a dead sleep, and she was terrified. She said, wake up, because there's somebody's in the baby's room. There's somebody's in the baby's room. And I thought, uh, I mean, I, that's what I woke up to. In the middle of the night, someone's in my house, you know. And so I, I didn't know, I, I jumped out of bed. I said, police! I don't know why I said it, I just did. Like, I don't know if I was identifying myself or calling for them, but I, that's when it came out of my, police! And I went to the baby's door, the, the baby's room door was shut. I looked for a weapon, I found it. It was a little one egg saucepan that the baby had been playing with on the ground in the hall. And I picked that up, like, all right, that's all I got. So I opened the door, ah! like that. And there was nobody there. We have a glass door. I think, oh, they go out the back. But Becky, what did he look like? Well, I didn't see him. What? She said, no, I went to the door, and as I tried to open the door to see, check the baby, he was, he was pushing back on the door. I go, are you talking about the door that sticks in the nursery? Oh, it sticks? Yeah. You can freak out about signs and misread signs and, and you become chicken little. But if Christ coming back soon freaks you out, I have a question for you, why? Remember in the book of James, he says, don't judge each other or hold grudges against each other for the judge is standing at the door. Now, When you hear the authorities are at the door, if I'm in a room with some people, I say, the cops are outside. They're coming in. They're at the door. Now, if that freaks you out, it's because you're doing something wrong. Now, if you're being held at gunpoint, and you go, the cops are at the door. Yay! 
So how you react to the fact that he's so close to coming back probably says something about you. Because for the believer, he's not just the judge. And by the way, the judgment is about getting rewards. The judge is at the door. Woohoo! he's finally here. It's not about condemnation. There's no condemnation for those that are in Christ. So if it freaks you out that Jesus could come back at any time, it's probably a, a wake-up call to you. Hey, why does that scare you? Why does that frighten you? Is he not your Savior and your Lord? Is he not your bridegroom? Because my judge is my bridegroom, my best friend, my Lord and Savior who has already proven that he loves me. I can't wait to see him face to face. I'm not afraid of him. Are you afraid of him? Then you're not mature in love. Perfect love casts out fear. So finally, be resolved to stay occupied until he comes. Let's have the worship team come. Be resolved to stay occupied until he comes. You know, people do look at signs like, well, does this mean anything prophetically that Iran is attacking Israel? Let me remind you of one thing as the worship team's coming together. You guys can stand if you will too. Jesus said this, when you see these signs begin to happen, freak out because your condemnation is near. No, he didn't say that. He said, look up. Your redemption. Things are looking up, you guys. Your redemption is drawing near. You can be excited about the fact that we're seeing not the events described in Ezekiel, but previews of things that must be in place for that to happen. Some of you women and some of you husbands who've gone through childbearing years might remember Braxton Hicks contractions. For those of you that don't know, Braxton Hicks contractions are usually called false labor because they aren't really evidence that the woman's about to give birth. And so they call it false labor. Jesus called the signs that he prophesied the beginning of birth pangs. The beginning. Not the delivery, but the beginning. Although people call Braxton Hicks contractions false labor, let me just say that yes and no. Why no? Because it only happens to pregnant women, usually in their third trimester. In other words, it's not the moment for delivery, but it happens to a woman who's pretty soon going to give birth. <laughs> and when we see signs going on in our world that aren't the sign, but they're evidence of a future, it's a preview, we have every reason to look up, get ready, because he's coming. Amen? Amen? Let's sing together. Since it's not your habit, I don't expect you to remember, but let me encourage you to remember. I, I, I don't know about you, I'm working on my memory lately. I, I shared this Wednesday night, I am. I'm you know, getting to a place where I'm noticing things, and worse, other people are noticing things that I'm not noticing. So I did a little research on the best 
thing to take to help your memory. I can't remember the name of it, but <laughs> it's true. Uh, my other problem is I don't remember to take it now. But anyway, I'm, I'm working on it. And I know it's not going to be something you're going to naturally remember to listen to Revelation chapter 1. It'll only take three minutes. You can do it on your way home. You can do it when you get home. Do it before. I don't really care when you do it, but I want to encourage you to do it. I want to ask you to believe God for the promise that he's promising you. You don't have to listen to mine. You can have somebody else read it to you, but do it. Let's test God with his word. Say, God, bless me then. Show me something. Help me to think about it differently or respond to it differently in a way that honors you. I think it's a good challenge. So uh, that's partially the reason I'm going to do it. I'm going to listen to the whole book of Revelation, not all at once, but I'm going to listen to it. And if it helps you, I'll be more than happy to help you continue in that blessing. God bless you. Mm -hmm.